Allah is a great wonder for us. He is the beginning and he is the hereafter. He is our king and he is the king of all of the creations in the universe. And his kingdom is the home for all of the creations in the universe. There is no other kingdom for the creations. Everything besides Allah perish perishes. Everything besides Allah dies. That is one of the great wonders of Allah, one of the great strengths of Allah. He supplies and protects, sustains, and maintains his creations. He has whatever we need. He has placed within the universe, in various places, all of the different things that we need. If you can get to these places appropriately, and you ask appropriately, you can get what it is you need. God can make goodness dwell within you. He can make wisdom dwell within you. He can bring every beautiful quality within you. Whatever you need, God has it and is capable of giving it to you. And if you come to the side of truth and enter into the proper stations, these things will become available to you. We individually shouldn't complain. We shouldn't say God doesn't give us things. Our minds go to the deepest pits of hell. And how can we expect God to give us things? when we are in that kind of a state. So we must really become cognizant that in order to be in tune with Allah, in order to commune with Allah, in order to know Allah, <coughs> in order to form a relationship with Allah, we have to be in a proper state. We have to be in a proper way. And then we can get his gifts. Now, we live in the world. And there are so many treasures in the world, or at least things that we think are treasures. But there's an interesting thing about worldly treasures. They come and they go. Gold can't sit still. It moves. It goes from one place to another. It doesn't rest. Worldly wealth comes and goes. You can't tie it up. It doesn't sit still. It keeps moving. The same goes for poverty. Poverty is not an everlasting thing. A rich man can become a poor man and a poor man and become a rich man. All of these things, of course, have their own difficulties at certain times. There's a story from Persia about a king who was dying, and he didn't have an heir. So he gave orders on his deathbed to his ministers that whatever person walked through the gates of the city upon his death would become king. Well, the ministers went ahead and made sure that they kept a lookout. And the first person who walked through the gates of the city as the king died was made the king. He was given the keys to his fortress, he was given the keys to his treasure house, and he was given all of the honors and regalia 
of being king. And he ruled. And after a while, the nobles and princes in the kingdom began to be upset with him. Why was he the king? Why weren't one of them the kings? And wars broke out. And now, all of a sudden, he was in danger and in difficulty. A friend of his had heard about what had happened to him and how he had become king and came to visit him and congratulated him. And he said, congratulations aren't really in order. Before I got here, all I used to worry about was getting a piece of bread the next day. Now I have to worry about the entire kingdom, about the entire land, and I can't even get to sleep. So riches don't always solve people's problems. Power doesn't always solve people's problems. It's said that when a rich man gives you his gold, he's actually doing himself a favor. It's not that he's being so overly generous to you. We need to become aware of this. And if we are after wealth, we should understand that this is a result of a kind of ignorance because we truly don't understand what it is that we need. We truly don't understand the real treasures of this world. Everything that we get from this world is subject to change. The treasures of the world come and go. You can't grab them and hold on to them. And the same goes for poverty. Poverty comes and goes. Some people, it stays for a while and then it leaves. Some people become rich. Some people become poor. Some people become famous. And then some people, after they're famous, become humiliated and degraded. Some have peace and harmony. Others have suffering. But there's a constant turning of all of these things. And the same person who has peace one day may be suffering the next. The same person who has wealth one day may have poverty the next. The man who's rich has this big smile and he flashes his teeth at everybody. But as time goes by, so do the teeth and the smile isn't quite the same anymore. They smile and they show their wealth and they show their fortune. But as time goes on, all of this changes. It doesn't last. Remember what God told you to do. He told you to find that true treasure that is his, that will never perish. He told you to look for that which is beyond being able to be diminished. Look for that which is beyond being able to change. The wealth of grace and the wealth of wisdom are the true wealth in this world. And if you can find grace and if you can find wisdom, you'll find that they can only be found through God. They can't be found in the world and in the way the world works. In order to be able to find grace and wisdom, we have to turn towards Allah and look to Allah for those gifts, because he is the only one who is able to give them. If you are attached to the world, and you are chasing what is in the world. The desire for the world is based 
and ignorance. It's based in looking for the bounty of ignorance. You are placing your faith in darkness. And we need to begin to place our faith in light. The world is full of torpor and hypnotic fascinations and illusions, things of darkness. We won't find things that truly satisfy us there. To find that, we have to turn towards God. He has everything. And he has placed everything in various locations throughout the universe. And when you are ready for those things, you will find those places. And then those gifts will become available to you. What does it take to find those gifts? What does it take to understand his truth, to find those gifts that cannot be diminished? Man often believes that he can just stay in one place and everything will come to him. It isn't so. Effort is needed to find grace. Effort is needed to find the qualities of God. Consciousness is needed to understand these things and to bring ourselves to the point where we are with these things. We need to be in a state where we can receive what it is that God has to give. What is that state? And how do we come into that state? This is all very special knowledge. And this is the knowledge that the sheikh gives to his disciples. This is the knowledge that the sheikh gives to his students. This is what the sheikh teaches. He teaches what it is you need to know in order to be able to obtain the gifts that God has placed throughout the universe for you. Without the guidance from a sheikh, you will not understand that these gifts are different than the gifts in the world. You will not understand that these gifts can't be diminished. That these gifts don't change in the way the world changes. Everything in the world is subject to change. Everything that God gives is immutable, unchangeable, and lasts forever. So we need to begin to perceive what it is that we need in order to enter into that phase where God's gifts are available to us. And what the sheikh teaches is that God's gifts are available to you when you enter into God's qualities, when you become God-like, when you begin to share in that which God has, God can then share with you that which he has. So if you're looking for peace and contentment, and you're looking for peace and contentment in the world of earthquakes and hurricanes and natural disasters and wars, you're not going to find peace and contentment. You have to remove yourself from that world and enter into God's space. Move over to the side of the road. Move away from the world's reality. Move away from that which is, in fact, illusion because it's constantly in a state of flux and move into that which stays constant. And that which stays constant is God. It's Allah. And for each particular thing that we want, 
we have to enter into a specific station. And what does it mean to enter into a specific station? We need to imbibe God's qualities. For instance, if you want contentment, you have to find peace. Peace is one of God's qualities. We have to be able to imbibe peace and become peace. Peace is not something to talk about. Peace is not something to look at. Peacefulness is something to be. Can we be in a state of peacefulness? What the sheikh does is he'll explain peacefulness to you. He'll explain what happens when you enter peacefulness. But secondarily, he'll also show you what it looks like. He'll show you what it is to be peaceful. You'll see that in the midst of chaos, he's the same. In the midst of difficulty, he's the same. Things don't affect him the way they affect normal man or man who is not yet reached wisdom. When man has trauma, he reacts to trauma in different ways. People become depressed, people become sad, uh, people become overwhelmed, people become angry, uh, people become other than appropriate because they are so attached to the things in the world that these things control who they are and what, they're, uh, what they are. Their attachment is so strong and powerful that they believe that that attachment to the world and the things of the world are what control their lives and will give them credence, and will give them status, and will give them purpose. And in truth, none of this is true. And unless we can detach from this kind of thinking, we will be subject to this kind of thinking all of our days. We walk around hugging everything that we have. Well, what happens when these things are taken away from us? What do we do then? And all of us are a little older. All of us have friends who are no longer here, who've disappeared. Well, what happened to all their things? They certainly didn't take them with them. They were left behind. So the importance of things is temporary. But the importance of grace is everlasting. The importance of wisdom is everlasting. The importance of God's qualities is everlasting. And we need to be able to understand this. So somehow... We have to separate ourselves into understanding what it is that we need to maintain our life in the world and what it is that we need to maintain our life in reality. These are two distinctly different places. Reality is forever. Hak is reality. God's reality. The formless reality. The place where form doesn't exist. But we live in the place where form does exist, yet we've lost consciousness of the fact that this body, <clears throat> which is made up of form, dissipates and disappears. We've lost sight of the fact that within us, there is a soul that was placed here by God that existed since the beginning of time and will continue to exist and is part of that which is reality. But if we lose consciousness of that, we lose touch with the fact that that is the only reality. It is difficult because of the nature of our senses. We feel and see and hear everything 
with our senses. And so we're constantly used to being put into places where we touch, feel, see, and hear. But think, all of us have jugular veins. And the blood flows through our jugular vein and keeps us alive. Yet, how many are aware of your jugular vein? Can you Are you conscious of the fact that you have it? Are you conscious of the fact that it's flowing blood through all parts of your body? Well, God is also within us. And he's maintaining and sustaining and protecting us at all times. But are we conscious of it? Well, it depends. You're conscious of it if you set the intention to become conscious of it. You become conscious of it if you set the intention to find a teacher to show you how to become conscious of it. You become conscious of it if you have a very strong faith. You're conscious of it if you constantly speak to God. And what is speaking to God? Prayer is speaking to God. But prayer is not necessarily a form of a, a specific nature. It can also be your own heart, your own, your own words, talking to God, directly forming a communication, forming a togetherness with him that you walk with all the time. This is something that we're all capable of. And as we bring him closer and closer to us, we peel away everything that separates him from us. As we come closer and go deeper and deeper into ourselves, we become closer and closer to him. And an old, a, 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 a metamorphosis goes on within us. We begin to change. As we fill ourselves with God's qualities, the inappropriate qualities leave us and goodness remains. And the more goodness that we have within us, the easier it is for us to stay in contact with God, the easier it is for us to be in touch with God. So we have to be conscious of the fact that we are in a state of flux and we can't be too hard on ourselves and we can't be too easy on ourselves. We have to find a middle ground to continue to move forward. We have to increase our faith, yet we can't be disappointed when things don't happen exactly as we think they should happen. We should know that God does things in his time, not in our time. We should know that his treasures are everywhere, and we will eventually find them when we become, when we come to the state that we're appropriate to have them. You can't be aggressive and angry and expect to be content. The sheikh will show you how aggression destroys contentment, how anger destroys peace and how you can't keep all of these qualities together. And we have to learn that these qualities can't be kept together. And we need to know that we go through different stations in our lives. We go through periods of time when we are appropriate and periods of time when we are not appropriate. Now, what is it that separates those periods of time? Well, we have to become conscious of our thoughts. We have to become conscious of all of our actions. We have to become conscious of all of our intentions. We have to become conscious 
of what it is we want and why it is we want it and what is the purpose for this need in our existence. If we can figure these things out, slowly we can come to the place where we can come close to the truth and the truth will become unveiled to us. The world is a place of torpor and hypnotic illusion. We need to escape from torpor. We need to escape from hypnotic delusion. Now, what is torpor? Torpor is something like lust. When uh, an elephant is in what they call it root, which means he's in lust, he wants to mate, he'll destroy everything in his path to fulfill that need. Well, the same thing happens to men. When they are in need of certain things, depending on the strength of that need, they will destroy everything in their path in order to get that particular thing. So we have to understand that this body is full of lust. It's full of needs. It's full of desires. It's elemental. And it does all the things that the elements do. Um, watch what a hur hurricane does. It causes enormous damage. Tornadoes cause enormous damage. Earthquakes cause enormous damage. Well, a man can be a walking earthquake. A man can be a walking hurricane. A man can be a walking tornado. And everything that he passes, he can destroy. Or a man can be a representative of the qualities of God. And then everywhere he goes is blessed by his presence. But all of these things are capable within man. That's how wide-ranging man is. That's how wide-ranging the abilities of man are. Everything that we see can be a sin. Our eyes are constantly looking to do things that are sinful. Our nose is looking to do things that are sinful. Our ears are looking to do things that are sinful. Our tongue is constantly wagging, looking to blame others, looking to find fault. How can we do away with all of these things that steer us towards sinfulness? Well, the first thing we have to do is become cognizant of our thoughts. We cannot be robotic in our interaction with our mind. We can't just let our mind run and follow it wherever it goes. We have to be conscious of our thought patterns, and we have to have the critical ability to see which of our thought patterns are taking us in a good direction and which of our thought patterns are taking us in an inappropriate direction. This means that we have to be able to watch ourselves, watch our mind as opposed to thinking that we are our mind, as opposed to thinking that we are our body. Unless we have this separation within us, where we watch what we're doing and what we're thinking from a critical point of view, we are subject to the haphazard nature of the mind and the haphazard nature of the body and the haphazard nature of all of the <clears throat> elemental pulls that exist within us. So we need to develop discretion. Now ask yourself, If you're able to watch your mind, if you're able to watch your body, if you're able to watch your thought process, who's doing the watching? What's doing the watching? 
And if you're not doing the watching, then who's running the show? You have to ask yourself these questions. And if you can conclude that you can, in fact, watch your mind, watch your reactions, watch your thought process, then you know that there's something else operating within you that is other than your mind. And this can come from what we'll call the heart or the soul. So we don't necessarily make our decisions from our mind. We make our decisions from our heart, soul, from the place of truth within us that's connected to truth. The mind is connected to the world. Desire is connected to the world. We need to make our decisions from the part of us that is connected to God. And if we can begin to understand how to do that, our life will change and we will become different people. But we have to begin to understand how to do that. And again, this is something that the Sheikh teaches us because he knows the difference and he has lived the difference and he explains the difference in two ways with words and with actions and when you see the calmness that the sheikh has in the midst of chaos you begin to understand that the worldly chaos doesn't affect him because the worldly chaos is in constant flux and in constant change, and he's in a place where there is no flux and no change, where things are steady and things are immutable and things don't dissipate. They don't disappear. They're not subject to all of the things that the world is subject to. So within us, we have two parts. One part is subject to all of the changes in the world. One part is subject to dissipating. One part is subject to disappearing. Another part is not subject to this. Another part of us cannot be diminished. Another part of us cannot be broken down. Another part of us doesn't dissipate. And how is that part different than the part that does dissipate? Well, the part that dissipates, the part that comes apart, is the part that believes in the world. The part that believes in the truth of the world. The part that believes that this world can feed us eternally. That this world can satisfy us eternally. And this is just not true. So we are all looking for that which can feed us eternally and satisfy us eternally and make us eternal. And where is that available? That's available through understanding Hak, through understanding Hakikat, the nature of Hak, the nature of reality. <clears throat> the nature of truth. And this can only be done by turning away from the world and turning towards God. And this isn't easy. If you want to plant a field and raise crops, there's a lot of work to be done. You have to prepare the soil. You have to plant the seeds. You have to water the seeds. You have to fertilize the seeds. A, you have to weed and make sure the seeds have the ability to grow. And all of this takes work. And you can't expect somebody else to do the work for you. It doesn't go like that. You have to do the work yourself. Now, there are always teachers along the way. There are horticultural teachers who will show you what's necessary to do the work to raise a garden. 
but you still have to do the work, but you need the knowledge. So you have to put yourself under the tutelage of somebody who knows as to whatever it is you want to do. A surgeon cannot go into the hospital and just begin to operate. He has to be taught. He has to be taught by someone who has experience doing that specific surgery. And how did he learn? He learned from somebody who did it before him. Now, he may improve on the technique that he was shown, but still, he was shown. And the sheikh will show us how to make this separation. And one of the things that he's going to tell us is that we must constantly ask for forgiveness. We must constantly speak to God about forgiving us for all of the things that we've done wrong. We have to become cognizant of all of the things that we've done wrong, and we have to have remorse about all of the things that we've done wrong, and we have to do penance for all of the things that we've done wrong. But it also means that we have to be conscious of all of the things that we've done wrong. And the consciousness of what we've done that's wrong should stay with us until that specific thing is no longer part of us. Then it can be forgotten and you can move on to other things. But we have to constantly ask for forgiveness and we have to constantly watch our thoughts. As our thoughts flow through us, we have to be able to differentiate the good thoughts from the bad thoughts and ask for forgiveness for the bad thoughts. And the for asking for forgiveness works in many ways. But one of the things that it does is it clears us of those evil qualities. It clears us of our attachment to those qualities. It makes us fresh again. It makes us new again. It makes us wholesome again. It brings about a purity within us. It cleanses us. So this act of asking for forgiveness is a cleansing, a cleansing that all of us need, that this body constantly needs, because this body is elemental and subject to all of the elemental forces that exist around it. And these elemental forces are constantly getting themselves into trouble. It's their nature. The mind is getting itself into trouble. It's its nature. Desire is getting you into trouble. It's its nature. We have to understand that, and we have to create a distance and a separation between ourselves and all of this. We have to enter into the state of wisdom. We have to enter into the state of grace. We have to have these with us wherever we go. And if the wisdom and the grace within us is strong enough, then arrogance will not have room to operate. Anger will not have room to operate. The mind won't influence us because we will be conscious of what it's trying to do to us and we'll turn away from it as soon as it moves in that direction. But this takes practice and it takes doing it and it takes being dedicated to a result. You know, to bring fruit to the table is a big process. Somebody had to plant the tree. Somebody had to look after the tree. Somebody had to <clears throat> water the tree, fertilize the tree. Somebody had to pick the fruit. The fruit had to be packed in crates to make sure it wasn't spoiled. And it had to be brought to market. After the food is finally brought to market, you go into the market and you buy a piece of fruit. You put it on the table. Then you cut it up. And finally, you get to the essence of it, which is 
the taste. Finally, you get to the taste. But to get to the taste of that fruit took a long time and a lot of involvement. To get to the essence of our truth is going to take a long time and a lot of involvement. And we have to be conscious of the fact that we want to accomplish this. So we have to set our intention to find the truth. We have to set our intention to work with the truth. We have to set our intention not to be dissuaded by all the glitters and the fascinations and the hypnotic illusions of the world. We have to be able to remove ourselves from all of these things and focus on that one point, which is God. And if we can keep that focus, if we can maintain that focus and that integrity within our own being, then the truth will come to us. We will be purified, and the gates to his kingdom will open for us. May that be what happens to each and every one of us. May we know his truth. May we know his reality. May his reality be our reality. And may we be blessed to be among those who are close to him. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.